Hi, welcome to CPAC Live, America Uncanceled. I'm Mercedes Schlapp, joined by... Matt Schlapp. <laughs> we're so excited to be back here. Well, I shouldn't say we're excited to be back in the swamp because we really enjoyed being in the free state of Florida, right, Matt? It was awesome. Matter of fact, I think when we have CPACs around the country, we should go to states that are open for business, that are using common sense, that don't have this lockdown mentality, which we can see in all the numbers, doesn't make anybody safer. Yeah, so we just came back from the incredible CPAC conference. Many of you were with us. Many of you were watching online. I got to tell you something. The participants felt hope again. That's right. They felt that they are ready to take on these battles that we're seeing happening across the country. Uh, what was your impression? Same deal, which is uh, people were very appreciative that we had the event. They were afraid that we would be canceled like so much has been canceled. School's been canceled. Some churches have been closed. Dr. Seuss is being canceled. Right. I mean, we got a whole so list. They were happy that we were there. They were joyful uh, because of it. And look, our title was America Uncanceled, which I think really captures this moment we're in. But the second thing is this idea that somehow everyone who's a conservative, anybody who supports President Trump, anybody who loves America's founding, that you need to be shut down somehow and yeah. they're tired of that no i think so and we uh, so many of the employees the workers came up to us thanked us for being in orlando because so they really wanted uh to get back to work and be able to make some money for their families and i think that it was a, a really a such a strong event but you know something cpac does not just end a couple days ago we've got cpac 365 we are committed to working every single day to let you know what's happening here at the swamp. Because just this week, while we were gone with all of our fellow freedom-loving patriots, what did Nancy Pelosi do in the House Democrats? Well, she did a lot of things, but maybe the worst thing, which is hard to come up with the worst thing, is this idea of HR1. I don't know if you all have been tracking HR1. Basically what HR1 does is take all of the illegality and the shenanigans of the 2020 election and put it into a nationalized election law. You don't necessarily have to go through any rigorous process to register. You just automatically registered, which will mean all these lists will be uh, wrong. You don't have to show an ID to vote. The federal government is going to start funding and matching campaign contributions, right? So you're going to have this idea that the federal government is going to control uh, the election process. All of the state reforms, the real reforms, to secure ballots, like in the state of Florida, where Ron DeSantis was elected in that close election to become Florida's governor, thank God, and he got rid of those two crooked election officials immediately. Right. All those types of reforms that Republicans can pass, remember in Florida, in Iowa, in Ohio, all with Republican governors, all had proper election safeguards. The polls actually got better for Republicans as time went on, but you'll notice in all these other states, where there weren't election secure, where there wasn't election security, the polls uh, got worse for Donald Trump and Republicans because, as we all know, they just jammed those illegal votes into the system. So what HR one would do would be to nationalize everything that went wrong on election day. You know what, sweetheart? Which is amazing is we have even some Republicans, some establishment Republicans, maybe even friends of ours, who are out there saying election fraud in 2020 wasn't a thing. But they're crazy against H.R. 1. Right. Why are they against H.R. 1? Because they know it's just going to mean more election fraud, more ability for big city mayors, all run by social stems now, to jam these illegal ballots through the system. And mail-in voting, oh, pretty soon we'll be electing our president by mail-in ballots, right. which no other country on the earth And does. I'm sure some of our viewers received multiple ballots in the mail. And you have to ask yourself the question, are these election files accurate? And what we found in places like Georgia and places like Nevada, they weren't. They were very outdated. A lot of times the names didn't match up with the addresses. They were vacant lots. Uh, yet nobody wanted to address this issue. But here, at American Conservative Union, we will continue to be talking about election integrity. We are working to stop HR1. That is a priority. 
Let's be real. This is not a bipartisan bill in any way. It is a partisan bill. And they are the ones wanting to fundamentally change our election system, our voting systems. They've been very effective in many of these states using COVID as an excuse. Uh, when you're talking about automatic voter registration, let's talk about this. You know that many illegal immigrants, for example, can go to the Department of Motor Vehicles. They're the ones that get a, a license. That means that they could be automatically registered if they don't have these safeguards in place. They want to get rid of verifications, uh, security verifications for many of these votes. This is very problematic. We do believe it's important for Americans to vote, but we want to make sure they're legal. We want to make sure they're citizens of the United States. There is a process in place. If, if It is our goal. And what is our call to action? Well, let me just say one thing on the call to action, which is when you see only Democrats voting for an election reform bill, it's not an election reform bill. It's a bill to elect only Democrats. Everything we've ever done with our elections that's truly reform has always been bipartisan in nature. Even the terrible McCain-Feingold bill, that couldn't pass without Republicans and Democrats both saying, hey, we're for this. This is all Democrats all the time so that big city mayors uh, who have their machines can basically, you know what, just basically put all these illegal votes in the count. Well, we here at American Conservative Union will be talking about election integrity and how we can ensure that we have free and fair elections. This is not about Republicans or Democrats winning. This is about ensuring that we have a fair election uh, where the legal votes are counted. Uh, with that, we had such a great time at CPAC. Great time. And uh, really enjoyed meeting so many of you all there. And really, we thank you so much for your support. Uh, but we want to give you the best of CPAC. Uh, CPAC Live, we got to host several shows while we were there. We have some exclusive content. Yep. Uh, so we want to share with you one of our CPAC Live shows. Uh, we had guests, including Senator Mike Lee. We had T.W. Shannon, the great leader from Oklahoma. We also had Big Dan. Dan Big Rode. D. Rhode Island. There you go. And the actor, producer, film uh, filmmaker, as well as writer, Kevin Sorbo. We had a great time talking yeah, to him. More than all that, he's just a great Twitter presence. Yes, he's, he uh, is. He's he got is. game. He's got game. So we, wanna, uh, we want y'all to watch, so stay tuned uh, to CPAC Live. But it was live from Orlando, Florida. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of CPAC Live with all that noise. I hope you heard that this is day one of 2021 CPAC here in sunny Florida. We have got a great show for you. We have Josh Hawley, who just got off the stage here at CPAC, a great senator from Missouri. We have Kevin Sorbo, whose wife Sam has written a great book, and we're going to talk to him about his amazing Twitter feed. We have the very tall T.W. Shannon. <laughs> from the less good state of Oklahoma because I am a Kansan and we are superior. We're gonna to talk to him and we're gonna get it all started with somebody I consider the standard of conservatism in the United States Senator, in the United States Senate, Senator Mike Lee. How are you, sir? Doing great. Honored to be here with my friends Matt and Mercy. Now, uh, Mercy, we had some Twitter action ourselves today, huh? From we did, actually, from the former chairman of the ACU, I won't even mention his name. Don't mention Literally, his name. Pete the press came out and called CPAC a cult. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, is CPAC a cult? No. No, because no. we stand for freedom, right? right? We are the cult of freedom is what I would call yeah. it. What was, what's your reaction yeah. to that? Uh, look, if it's a cult of freedom, if it's a cult of awesomeness, That's then right. heck yeah. That's <laughs> right. You know, you know, look, it's a slur. Uh, being a Utah, it's um, uh, a, a word that I've heard thrown around from time to time, always by people who are just haters. That's right. Who hate, what, who hate you for who you are, not just what you do. So... <laughs> Badge of honor. So let me ask you, you responded to the tweet. What, I did, and because I'm getting so old and I can't read a screen without like a couple pairs of glasses and the rest. Shop, you've been old since I, you were like 30, so I don't know truth. what you're talking it's about. It's the truth. As my wife always says, I was born in the wrong century. Yes. She means I should have been born in the previous century. But, the, uh, <laughs> but basically, when you have these conservatives who tell you, these Republicans, you serve with some, who tell you that they're conservative, and then they lecture you when you're being a little too rambunctious because that's just not how conservatives do things. What they really mean is when you say you're a conservative, it doesn't mean you actually want to get the stuff done. You just want to talk about it. And, uh, and so what I say to folks that 
even in our organization who have been chairman and on the board and here's this great conservative institution, but all of a sudden when they see uh, folks like Donald Trump getting stuff done, conservative stuff done, overwhelmingly wonderful conservative achievements, eight years of achievements in four years, uh, they're, they're going to call him a cult. And, uh, and just so happened, just so you know, those people who do try to disparage the work of conservatives, always look at them. I think it's amazing people in the media who say, well, Donald Trump, how could he be a conservative? He's been married three times. Look at every one of those people on MSNBC and CNN <laughs> making that criticism. I don't know how they do that. They kind of look inside their own house. And anyway, we're very proud of who but, we are and what we are and, and what we're doing here at CPAC. But one of the things we've learned, and Senator Lee, you know this, you didn't agree with the president 100% of the time. You you sometimes were, you know, had your, you, you brought things up to challenge some of the things that the president did. But did he, did, were we able to advance the conservative agenda in the last four years? Heck yeah. And they wouldn't be challenging him if they didn't know that. If they know That's that. Right. It, and they hate it. Look, um, there is a, a rigid pro-government orthodoxy that's taken control of the mainstream media in this country, the educational establishment, uh, and so many other institutions. And that orthodoxy was met up against something that they regard as blasphemy. Anytime you, you undermine the sacred role of government and the dominance of government, they get mad. And so look, uh, some of those same people, what would they have said of the founding fathers? A revolutionary cult? A freedom cult? Yeah, yeah, they were, and it won. And we are all the beneficiaries of their good work on that effort. So uh, one of the things we've done at CPAC this year is we believe that uh, there's a reason why no Democrat ever wants to amend the Constitution. They just go to judges. We actually want to have amendments. We always offer them because it's the honest way to change the Constitution. And what I'm really beginning to realize is, and the question we're asking here at CPAC, do they believe in these constitutional principles at all? including the Bill of Rights, and you kind of got this whole conversation started today. Give uh, our listeners an idea of what you said at CPAC. Yeah, this morning I talked a little bit about the fact that uh, freedom and government power are at odds with each other. Uh, anytime government acts, it does so at the expense of individual liberty. doesn't mean that government's bad. We need it to protect life and liberty and property. But the further afield we go from that, the harder it is to make the case that it's worth government action. At the center of our freedoms, our ability to protect freedom itself depends on uh, the affirmative commands of the Bill of Rights, that thou shalt not to the Constitution. The center of that is the First Amendment, and at the center of the First Amendment is the freedom of assembly. This is one of the most underappreciated, uncelebrated features of the First Amendment and the entire Constitution, but it's upstream from everything else. Our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, uh, uh, so many other core freedoms are downstream from and ultimately depend upon our freedom of assembly. And yet that's what's under assault with the global pandemic. We've got to push back against it. So we're here to assemble. CPAC is in the Constitution, not in so many words, but when people come together to talk politics and to learn and to have a point of view, that should be protected. It should be protected from government action. Now, look, if people are concerned about that, understandably, for one health reason or another, then individuals should exercise due caution. Uh, maybe organizations will decide not to meet at all. It should never, ever be the place of government. Right. People should do that, never government. And we, we've allowed governments, including many states and municipalities, to go far uh, uh, too much into that domain, which is not theirs. So this week, you introduced the Legislation Promise Act. Can you walk us through what that means? Social media companies have brought people in. The commoditization of clicks and eyeballs has been rampant and it's uh, been interesting, but they've lured people in with the promise of political even-handedness, of political neutrality. Right. Yeah, they yeah. profit yeah. off of people's belief in that, which has turned out to be false. Their policy statements on content moderation, the public statements of their CEOs have been false, demonstrably false. I've asked the CEOs of these companies in hearings in the Judiciary Committee and the Commerce Committee, I sit on both, can you name a single instance where you've done the same things to prominent liberals as you have to prominent conservatives? They couldn't name any That's because right. there aren't. That's right. and, and, and so look, it, it's the right of a leftist if a leftist wants to build a leftist enterprise. But, and there's nothing that the government can or should do about that in the abstract. But if they're lying to people in order to get them 
to participate in it and in order to win their clicks and their eyeballs, there's going to be accountability. That's what the Promise Act is about. It, it directs the FTC to take action against those entities that promise to be underhanded, to be even-handed, and then they undercut that by, by uh, uh, directly weighing in for the left the, the, and against the right. Look, we have a real live example here at CPAC. Twitter used to come here in, in the early days and try to get us to use Twitter. And they say, we'll help you learn how to use it and we'll get all these fine people to get on Twitter. They were in the back, in the nucleus of CPAC, helping us to grow our footprint on Twitter. And now it seems they wanted to do just the opposite. Now, you know, I don't know whether it was fraudulent before or whether there was like a, a, an honesty that's coming out that they always had this intention. But um, what your legislation basically says is you got to hold to your promise. Yes, if you state a policy, if you state that you're going to be even-handed, and that's how you get your clicks and your eyeballs and your users, and, and then you, you, you go against that, the FTC is going to go after you under my bill. So let me ask you, Senator, do you think that we should break up big tech? Is that the solution? Under the right circumstances, our competition laws might kick in. Under the right circumstances, breaking them up might become a possibility. I'm not at all sure that we're there yet, but there are investigations underway, there are legal actions underway that could result in that. In the meantime, I, I think there are other things we can do in order to direct them to stop this kind of misleading, uh, dishonest behavior. It's, it's appalling what they're doing. Uh, because so many Americans now get so much of their political information from social media, they need at least uh, a, a source uh, that will tell them the truth about whether they're going to tell them the truth. You look at what happened to Parler recently. Uh, so Parler came on the scene. They had a different business model. Parler said, we're not going to get involved in this at all, in politics at all. And they meant it. A and they had a, a more relaxed content moderation policy but they've stuck to it and they have means of enforcing it. They got deplatformed. Uh, they got taken off of Amazon's cloud services, shutting them down altogether for a while. They've been taken off of Apple's App Store and Google's App Store. Why? Well, perhaps it might have something to do with the fact that they treat people even-handedly. That's messed up. That's, messed up. That's a big problem. That's the key, and I think what we're looking at is, so I remember Jack Dorsey would meet with the conservative leaders, remember that? He would meet with conservative leaders, listen to conservative leaders, and yet you feel like no action's being done. But we thank you for taking these bold steps. We thank you for your incredible work in the Senate. We are so blessed to call you and your lovely wife, Sharon, friends. You are fighters, warriors, and constantly on the front line, helping to defend our Constitution, helping to defend Americans' freedoms. And with that, we are going to be right back. But remember to download that CPAC app. We are live streaming the whole entire conference. It's a great way to get wonderful information. Go to cpac.conservative.org. We'll be right back. There's just such a, 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 an array of people. There's a diverse group of people. I don't care if you're white, black, Spanish, gay, straight, whatever the case is, everybody's here. It's nothing but love. You have all the media outlets that we love to watch here. It's just an atmosphere of love. It's an atmosphere of education. And just seeing all the different speakers is just an incredible experience. Welcome back to CPAC Live. I just, I'm just so thrilled about our next guest, okay? Yes, we do have Hollywood here. I don't know what you're talking about, people. I don't know why you're thinking that we don't have great actors who support the conservative causes here. But with us is Kevin Sorbo. He is an, not only an actor, but a producer, a director, an author. And we, I can't even tell you. And a really nice guy. So, yeah. that, that's what I hear. And as Schlapp says, you were saying he's got the best Twitter in town. Oh my God. Now it's, don't tell Donald Trump because apparently he was banned. So, you know, we, it, don't, want, we don't want it to get I don't know how you're contagious. not banned. <laughs> well, you know, you should be banned. No, we put very funny, I'm not, I don't get as crazy there that I did on Facebook. Facebook took me down a week and a half ago. Oh. They took 550,000 followers away from me. I'm gone. And the reason was they didn't like my posts about voter fraud and COVID and things like that. I post the truth but the left hates the truth they do they love to live in darkness and i try to bring light into the world but they don't like that i love the light That's no they don't true. like it so uh how did you like fall into social media like it was just like a voice and it was just like it had well, to get out of you yeah i guess you know everybody was doing it anyway so i sort of kind of dove into it and said okay 
And then I, you know, you get in these movie sets and you hear people say that and the other thing. I, well, well, give me some proof of what you're just saying. Because they love their labels, right? You're a racist. You're a homophobe. You're, you know. And I go, well, how am I these things? I mean, they're, they're just, just being a conservative is enough for them to say those things. They have no proof behind it. Yeah. It's like the years they were calling President Trump a Nazi. I said, how is he a Nazi? And like Antifa, for instance, they're against fascism. They're the fascists. That's, That's all, right. It's all about projection. About that. So I got tired of it. So I started going after people and saying, come on, guys, let's look at the other side of the issue. But they don't like doing that. Well, you have a powerful voice, but I do feel like, don't you feel like they put post-it notes on you? Like you're sure. a racist, you're this, you're that. Yeah. And it's, I think, so discouraging because what's happening is people are scared. There are a lot of Americans Different. out there who feel that they are being bullied on That's social right. media, okay. that oh they can't God. speak up, that they're <laughs> yes. going to lose their job. As yeah. I say, the cancel culture equates the destruction sure. of the individual. How do you fight back? Like, how do you well, develop the thick skin to be like, sorry, I, can, I am not I, shutting up? I can say two plus two is four, and I'll get 10 guys going, I hope you die. <laughs> so it's, like, yeah. it's just, if you don't like me on if it's social media, then don't follow me. Right. I mean, I, I hate that, that they hate the facts and the truth. But here's the thing, Facebook took me down. I'm still on Twitter. I love CloudHub. I'm doing a thing with CloudHub later. They were just up there. I'm, the I'm, CEO on, I'm on there now, there. and I think they're absolutely yeah. phenomenal. And I got to give one more plug. There's another one called Free Space. Free Space is a whole different sort of vibe. So I hope people go check that out, because that's where I moved to, those two places. They're awesome. But the reality is, Hollywood said to me, my manager and agent about 10 years ago said, we can't promote you anymore. And I said, why? Is it because of being a Christian, being a conservative? And I said, aren't you the guys that believe in tolerance and freedom of speech? But it's all a one-way street. It and it gets very, very frustrating. So I hate the fact that I got kicked out of Hollywood, but I'm still part of Hollywood because I do movies like God's Not Dead, Soul Surfer, What If, Let There Be Light. I just booked, I just finally, we raised money for the next Left Behind movie. So you people are, are fans of Left Behind books. We're doing Left Behind pretty We're going to start working with you a lot more because our yeah. network needs to know about your content. And my favorite fraudulent issue out there is the climate hoax stuff. Yeah. Tell folks very quickly as we close up about your documentary and where they get it. Climate Hustle 2, the number two, climatehustle2.com. Go there. We're here promoting it right now. I narrate it. I'm on camera. There's a documentary showing that there's a huge amount of scientists and people that are scholars on the other side to show what climate uh, uh, global warming really is. It's called weather. There's a hundred year, <laughs> there's a hundred year study. There's a hundred year study of the average temperatures around the world do you know how much we've grown up in, the, in weather and in temperature? 0.41 degrees, not even a half degree in the last century. But let's spend trillions of dollars and keep people in fear, just like we're doing with the face mask and all this thing right now. We're using this as fear as a weapon to control our lives. People, apathy is the biggest killer. Fight back. Gosh, yep. You right. know what we have to understand yep. is we can't control the weather. What a shock. Wait, and we got uh, a book. My, late, my wife's latest book, Words for Warriors, check it out. It's an amazing book, perfect for what's going on in CPAC right now. Learn to fight back. Stop being afraid of being people bullying. There's a lot of cyber bullies out there, but trust me, their lives aren't perfect either. <laughs> Kevin Sorbo, thanks for being with Thank us. You. Thank you for being at CPAC. It's been fun, huh? It's been fun. I'm having a blast. We've got a lot more coming at you. We'll be right back with you after this short break. Bye. Really a fun time. We've had a lot of, I've had a blast with my friends. I met a couple of friends. It's very hype, very excited. And I'm really looking forward, especially to Sunday when Trump's coming. It's definitely going to be the highlight. Welcome back to CPAC Live. I am so thrilled to be spending time with you. This is what we call our date, not only date night, but date during the day. And we don't really get to see each other much, but you're having a good time so far. I'm What's been your impression? I'm having a good time, except I did kind of pass out last night because <laughs> I don't think I've ever walked so far in my whole life. This is like, the thing about Orlando is these hotels are big. They're big. They're really They're spread big. out. They're like indoor cities. It's uh, it's kind of amazing. But like we love what's going on here. The people are great. And, uh, you know, I had so much fun on the campaign trail. I didn't like how it ended, but I had so much fun on the campaign trail. I met so many. I hope to be lifelong friends. And one of them is going to join us, T.W. Shannon, the former Speaker of the House of the great state of Oklahoma and the CEO of the Chickasaw Bank, That's correct. running things uh, like all great conservatives. He can do his politics, but when he drops out of politics, 
He knows how to run things. We're just trying to survive people. the Biden economy. That's <laughs> yeah. all we're trying to do. Yeah, just trying right. to survive. But, but anyways, if you decide to run again, just call the Schlapps. We're coming with a big pink bus or the big red bus Seriously, or something. Seriously, we're, we're all behind we're that. We're campaigners, okay? I, you, know, you know, I'm big fans of yours, Mercy, as well as Matt. <laughs> I got to know him over the campaign. I tell you what, you guys have been on the front lines fighting for conservative values for a long time. And it's just an honor for me to be here with you, honestly. Well, TW, let me ask you because I know the you TW were... thing is a little bit. It's unique. Well, my, well, every time someone says TW, they're like, they can't be right. So, so my, what's the name? Name? Yeah, so, I, I so my, name. my full name is Tarahan Wayne. So that's even more difficult. No, so, yeah, I love it's it. a Chickasaw name. I'm Chickasaw. I'm named after my great great grandfather. So where does it mean? Um, so my mom told me a long time it meant great leader, but I can't really substantiate that anymore. <laughs> but I'm just gonna go with. Let's just I don't go know. With it. Let's I really go with it. let me tell you, Schlapp does not mean great leader. Okay, <laughs> that's not what the last name means. But uh, we had the I had the opportunity to watch your panel, and you were with Lawrence Jones, yeah, yeah. who's one of the Fox News contributors and host. Uh, Wayne Dupree was on, was. and Spencer Brown as well. Yeah. And you all really uh, touched upon. You know what was ha what is happening in these cities? How are these cities that are run by Democrats have, in, in essence, been destroyed? I think one of the interesting points you made is the essential versus the non-essential. Right. And what are we all? Well, you know, the point I was making is when we're talking about this mob mentality, yes. which is what we're seeing yes. dominate, whether it be the media or, or even the state government mob, right, or the federal government mob, where people <laughs> feel a sense of hopelessness. That's why mobs are created, whether it's on the right or on the left. It happens when people feel a sense of hopelessness, and hopelessness is caused by governments. When governments grow too big, people lose hope. And unfortunately, the left's message, their answer for hopelessness, is more government. That's right. And so, our, our, you know, I think our challenge as conservatives is it's not enough just to be right. You know, we're right on taxes, we're right on life, we're right on defense, we're right on the Constitution. It's not enough to be right. You got to be right, but you also got to go out and tell your message to people that haven't heard it before. So, uh, and that's a little bit of the problem with CPAC, right? Because people assume we're just talking to other uh, people who agree like this. But it's really not true. If you only knew, there's so many young people who are here, high school students, college students. Maybe they're here because their parents urged them to come. And there's a lot of people in the audience who don't necessarily know where they are. We had uh, uh, a former reporter from the New York Times speaking earlier today who's not a conservative. He was in shock. He said that I was standing on the CPAC stage. And then you have the millions of people that are watching over, I mean, all around the globe, because sure. we go around the globe now, but all over the country. Uh, you know, TW, it's a big audience. What do you think people want to hear? You know, well, you know what I said before, I opened up this morning by saying this. Number one, make no doubt about it, Donald J. Trump is still the leader of this party. That's the first thing we have to understand. He is the leader of our party, but that doesn't mean we're like Democrats. It doesn't mean that we all get in line and think exactly the same way no. and that we follow, no, Republican, it's not in our DNA to do that. We're gonna have a debate, we're gonna have a spirit of debate, but there's no civil war in the Republican Party. We're one party. The civil war is with AOC and Nancy Pelosi. That's where the real civil Popcorn. war is. Popcorn, absolutely. Popcorn. Absolutely. Uh, I might have to disagree with the boys here, okay? I think that there is this tension in the Republican Party right now where you have those people, those Republicans, whether they be never Trumpers to say, President Trump doesn't have a role in the party. How do you re re reconcile that 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 divide, that that tension that we're seeing right now? But tension is good. We like tension. As, as conservatives, we like tension. We don't want everybody thinking exactly like I do. Now I know I'm right. Boring. That's exactly you right. Know what? I know I'm right too. I know I'm right. That's exactly right. But but at the end of the day, yeah. I'm not trying to cancel you. Where right. we may disagree, that doesn't mean that I think you're not valued as a human being. And that's what the left does. That's why the left, when we saw this as the pandemic, the pandemic has exposed so much about who the left really is, right? When you have people waking up every single day as Americans and they're having to think about, am I gonna watch and listen to my local mayor to decide if I am an essential or non-essential person? My constitution, my Bible tells me that every single individual is essential. There's no such thing as a non-essential person. That's why we're different from the left, because we believe that, that every person is in, you know, we're, we're with inalienable rights, right? That they're given to us by God. That's what makes us different from the left. And we value the idea of differences of opinion. But at the end of the day, just like we did before, Donald Trump united this party like nobody else. Now, we've always had the Never Trumpers. They were never with us. The swamp is not going to be with us. We don't need them. We did it before without them. We'll do it again. Yeah, but we got to win these elections. I mean, that's going to be key from local to state to federal. We got to keep our eyes on the ball as we move forward in the next couple I, of years. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but TW, I think you ought to give it a shot again. 
and run for office. That's my view. <laughs> Feel and free what, to announce at CPAC. And what, I think that works and what great. TW is saying is nobody's irredeemable and actually nobody's deplorable. That's Absolutely. Right. And it's a great message. And we love you being with us. We're going to have you back. Okay? Thank you. Thanks for having back. me, Matt. Anytime. We're going to come you back. Come, Thanks come for being with us on CPAC Live. We're going to be right back. Being with like-minded people, meeting such great conservatives. I'm meeting candidates, potential candidates. I've met so many of the political figures that are already in office that really want to help and make America great again. Welcome back to CPAC Live. We are having a great time here at CPAC. And as I alluded to uh, earlier in the day, uh, we had a great time on the campaign trail. We didn't love how everything ended, obviously, but met so many great people. It takes a lot of courage to run for office. And our next guest had that courage. He's actually had the courage to do a lot of half crazy things. Big D, <laughs> Dan Rodheimer, great to be with you again. Matt, thank Dan. you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for having me. What a great event. Hey, I got a question for everybody out here. Who's excited about being at CPAC? Yeah. Who loves Matt Schlapp? Yeah. I love him. <laughs> hey, Matt I, Matt, I got a question for you. Out of Congress right now. I'm getting nervous, okay? I'm just a little bit nervous. Go ahead. We're actually going to do a WWE match right after this, by the way. <laughs> so, Matt, out of, out of, right now in Congress, yeah. we have all these new congressmen coming in. Who's the breakthrough congressman, congresswoman, that, uh, that you're the most fired up about? Uh, you know, on the House side, which is where a Big D ran for the House out in Nevada, and you won. So another one, you're another one of the casualties of illegal voting. But uh, this guy, this young man who's around here in these hallways, uh, who i gotten to know a little bit, uh, Madison Cawthorn, just really seems like a great guy. So that'd be like the name that comes right off the top of my head, probably because I've seen him here. He's young. He's polite. He seems very conservative. Uh, the left wing is having a trouble hating that guy. Yeah, you know, Madison, I became very, very close with him. And did you know, you know, he got into that car accident. Yeah. And the money that he got in his lawsuit, he put all that money towards his race. Oh, I didn't know that. That's how much he believed. Yeah. And that's how hard he pushed. So yeah, I, I love Madison. And, great, and great kid. Here's why I think he's got character, because ACU actually endorsed his opponent. And, uh, and it was one of these big, vigorous primaries, and there were probably multiple good candidates. But Madison won that primary. And then uh, usually when that happens, that person kind of hates you forever in politics. And Madison sent me a text and said, hey, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about the race. And I thought, he's got character and class. He does. And we need a little bit more of that in the swamp, wouldn't you say? We, we need to keep draining it, brother. Yeah. We need to keep draining it. And, you know, when you were out in Las Vegas, about right, right after the election, Matt called me, called me up, and he says, Dan, I'm going to be out here. We're trying to fix this, this voter issue. It was all mail-in ballot. And you busted your butt for three weeks, four weeks you were out there? Well, that was a couple trips, yeah. Four weeks. So I guess that's, you know, that's going to be a major issue coming in, you know, for 2022. You know, what do you think we're going to be able to do for the, you know, the swing states like Georgia and Nevada, you know, to make sure we take these back? So it's really simple, and we're spending a lot of our agenda talking about what happened in these states, and it's a really easy solution. You should only be able to vote if you're legally allowed to vote. You should be registered to vote in order to vote. In order to show that you're legally registered, you should have to show an ID. And, and if you have to vote by mail, and some people need to, you simply just have to have the security on the other end by having signature verification. Those things were not done this cycle. If we don't go, if we had voted like we did in 2016, Donald Trump would have four more years and you'd be in Congress. There's no doubt about it. Facts. There's no doubt about we it. We have a question. I do. One of our it's... great volunteers. It's good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you for having me here at CPAC. Um, I'm curious, how is CPAC 2021 going and are we coming back to Orlando next year? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. She's putting me on the spot because we have a signed contract in the swamp. So we'll have to see how all that goes. But uh, I have been really impressed. First of all, I feel less stress here. When we have CPAC in, uh, in Washington, D.C., it just feels like there's double, triple, quadruple the stress. Maybe that's indicative of like everything that goes through Washington, D.C. And the vibe in Florida has been wonderful. But I think, Florida. yes, that's right, that is Florida. But Carrie, the reason why I think uh, it's so special here at CPAC 2021 is because everybody's so happy to be with each other. We all miss each other. We 
we want to be with each other. We want to see your beautiful face, and we all want to share and talk. People were meant to be together. And if yeah. you want to be with a lot of people, just go to the Rodimer family. I mean, that's a lot of people. We only have six. <laughs> I, I only beat you by one. You have five girls. We're and done. I got well, meet. maybe we're not done. You never know. Hope never springs know. eternal. Yes. <laughs> well, this is uh, a great event. I couldn't believe how many, how, how many people we have here. People are fired up. They're excited. And uh, every year, it's a great year here at CPAC. Big D, thanks for being with us. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on CPAC Live. I'm so sorry that Mercy abandoned me, but there's so many exciting things happening at CPAC. She's actually on the stage as we speak. And what a great first day we've had, and we're going to be back at you tomorrow night. Thanks. For